We've talked about this figure many times, and now we'll finally actually get a chance to see the simulation that captures this phenomenon of going from basic oriented edge features in V1 up to high level object representations and higher levels of infratemporal cortex. The core challenge of object recognition is being able to recognize the object regardless of where it shows up in your retina. So I can kind of look sideways, different ways, see things, and I'm not always seeing an object at the same exact point on my retina. It can be closer up, farther away, different angles, and that variability in the way that an object appears is what makes it very difficult and challenging to recognize objects. And this little diagram shows you the nature of that difficulty. And in fact, it, it's very much like the XOR problem that we looked at in the learning chapter. So uh, there is in fact no overlap if a object moves to a different part of your retina in terms of those basic neural signals coming in from your eyeballs. So here's an A in one position in one size, here's an A in another position in another size, they may even be different colors. All these things lead to there being different uh, neural signals for each of these two different patterns. And yet we effortlessly recognize those as the same kind of pattern because we have this ability to do what we call invariant object recognition or invariant pattern recognition, which is making our uh, internal high-level representations the same or invariant with respect to these differences in input position, size, rotation, color, etc., all these different features. And you can see here that, in fact, just like that XOR problem, we want to call these two things different even though they overlap you know the most of, the, of these four different patterns um, and uh, yet we want to call these things that don't have any overlap the same so the patterns of activity overlap in the visual inputs are exactly anti-aligned with the categories that we want to form at the high level and that that really is the same thing as the XOR problem and it, it's what makes object recognition difficult and it's why Hebbian solutions to object recognition have never worked. And only with the advent of these deep um, multi-layer neural networks using particular techniques have we, have we really gotten significant progress in the object recognition problem. Interestingly, the new machine learning object recognition models that uh, have become very popular these days are based on ideas that go back quite a, a few years. A paper from 1986 by Fukushima um, called the Neocognitron that outlined the idea probably the first time in the published literature. And we've actually developed these models uh, from a long time ago. We had uh, a version of this model in 2000 in our textbook. So we've also been working with these ideas for a long time. And the key idea, which is, we'll see in a moment, very directly supported by the biology of the uh, neurons in the visual uh, cortex, is again to use a hierarchy, but in specifically a hierarchy that increases as you go up along two important dimensions. One is feature complexity, and that's what we've been emphasizing, that, that as you go up to these higher layer, layers in the hierarchy, the number of kind of different features that a given neuron is responding to, the complexity of the input pattern that it is able to discriminate goes up. However, there's also a, this critical factor of spatial invariance. We need to be able to recognize objects in different positions, sizes, etc. And that also goes up as we go up the hierarchy. And so this diagram shows you how as you go from V1 to V2, the neurons in V2 have greater featural complexity by recognizing combinations, these intersections, uh, junctions of oriented edge features that are represented in V1, but they also recognize them over a range of different locations and presumably angles, sizes, etc. So this incremental buildup of little bits of invariance with respect to these transformations, these, these changes in the spatial layout of these features builds up as you go up the hierarchy. So now when we go to V4, 
these are now incorporating those invariances that have already been built up on the way from V1 to V2 and adding additional ones and saying, okay, well now I'm going to recognize this kind of bottom L-like feature regardless of where it shows up within a range of different locations here in the V2 layer. And that enables it to not only develop more complex uh, feature coding as you go up, but also more invariance, recognizing these features over a greater range of different uh, transformations. And this again proceeds again as we go further up to V4 to IT, and this really shows you the importance of the hierarchy in developing these uh, complex object feature detectors and spatial invariance. And critically, by doing these incrementally, you avoid this major problem of binding errors where, for example, you, we, you don't want to have a high-level uh, representation of this kind of backward C detector um, be activated by a feature down here on the left-hand side and uh, another feature over here on the right-hand side that don't actually connect to each other, right? This would be kind of uh, miscombining features across different objects. And that's a kind of called the binding error. So instead of doing it all in one step and recognizing any feature anywhere uh, across the entire visual field as being kind of that L feature, you're doing it incrementally so that you know that these features are uh, were present together in the same spatial location to some extent at least um, in the in the lower levels. As we have more and more complex feature detectors with overlapping encoding of these different features, you can also eliminate any of these binding errors. Again, in the distributed representation way, kind of combine across the coding of lots of these different ways of, of representing the individual sub-features, and that makes sure that, for example, it's this same line that connects these two and not two disjointed lines, even within this more narrow range of spaces. But as we mentioned, there is good evidence that this is what's going on in the brain. This is data from Keiji Tanaka's lab in Japan, and we actually looked at this earlier in the networks chapter, all coming from the same studies. And this is showing you the progression of different complexities of uh, neural responses as you go up the hierarchy in uh, from V2 to V4 to the posterior, and then finally to the anterior uh, part of infratemporal cortex. And just by looking at this, you can kind of see that the neurons are responding to more complex kinds of features. Here you have a face-like stimulus. You can see our favorite uh, kind of funny nose detector that we saw and, and talked about in the, in the networks chapter. And, you know, it may not be that there's really obviously a lot more complexity going from V4 up to IT, but uh, these sampling techniques probably underestimate the overall level of complexity of the, uh, of the featural coding that these neurons have because they're dependent on the creativity of the experimenter to come up with all these different stimuli, and so they may not have just tried the right stimuli. And what we can see here in this graph is a way of quantifying uh, more, more precisely how these uh, receptive fields are changing as you go up into these higher layers of the hierarchy. And really what this is showing you is the proportion of neurons that fire most to simple cell kind of stimuli. And simple cell are the oriented V1 edge detectors that we saw in the previous simulation, just these simple kind of edge detectors. Um, this bar on the right is telling you what proportion of the neurons respond maximally to that compared to one of these other kind of stimuli that they tried. And so you can see for V2, actually most of the neurons really do respond still maximally to those simple oriented edge detectors. Um, they also do respond to, to other kind of feature conjunctions, and this probably underestimates the extent to which they do that. Uh, but still they're having very robust responses to these kind of simple stimuli. But now when you go to V4, you can see that it's increasingly responding more to these more complex stimuli and not quite as much to the uh, simple cell stimuli. And this progression increases with more complex stimuli coming in in posterior IT. And then by the time you get to anterior IT, 
you really finally do get m the majority of the responses being uh, to these more complex stimuli and not as much to these simple uh, oriented edge detectors. Likewise, as you go up the same hierarchy from V2 to IT, you also see that the size of the receptive field is increasing progressively as you go up. And this means essentially that as you accumulate these kind of invariance transformations at each step as you go up the hierarchy, the effective of range of different spatial locations, for example, that will activate a given neuron here just has gotten much wider as a result of the accumulated effects of these kind of cones stacking up as you go up. And that's really what we're seeing here is that by the time you get up into anterior infratemporal cortex, you have neurons that are responding up to about 20 degrees of visual angle. And that's about the uh, size of your laptop screen um, at a normal viewing distance, in, in, interestingly. So that's, that's the reference point for that. Um, and in, in all these visual studies, we always talk about degrees of visual angle, as that is really the only thing that you can kind of reliably measure, as every other size measure depends on the distance away from you. So when we go back and look at our diagram of the retina, you can also see that this 20 degree angle is about the extent of uh, where you have cones still falling off very rapidly, but that's kind of the outer limits. And so this kind of parafoveal region defines essentially that the scope over which you can do any kind of significant level of object recognition. Beyond that, it's, it's kind of really into the periphery of your vision where you really aren't seeing very thick any, anything in, in any kind of great detail.